If it is Tuesday, August 9th, that means it's Tuesday. And if it's Tuesday, it means it's time for Comic Book School Live because on Tuesdays, we go live every time and we own Tuesday. That was a marble mouthed way of saying I never get it right. My name is Buddy Sclera, and I'm a comic book creator with over 20 years of comic book writing experience. And I come to you to help articulate the craft and business of making comics and also on a night like tonight, dive deep into the analysis of storytelling. And who better to bring along than my good friend, my co-host, three-time Emmy Award-winning writer, Mike the Knife Fasolo. Hi, bud. Do they call you Mike the Knife out there? Uh, Brian still calls me Mike the Knife. Mike the Knife. Yeah. I think we Jim might really, as well. I wonder who, who, how did that name come up, Mike? That came up from uh, Jim, put that in the magazine at one point. Mike Mikey the Knife. the Knife Fasolo. Yeah. <laughs> That was one of the, he had to do, I don't know, one of the columns he was writing. He had a multiple choice of who did what, and Mike the Knife for Solo was one of the choices. I, well, it's funny about it. Is it stuck? Yeah. I had it on the back of my wizard jersey when we used to play softball. Mike the Knife. Nice. Yep. I played softball, too. I wasn't very good. Were you any good? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think they let me play one or two games, and then they're like, you can just sit on the bench and, you know. Be, they you'll were be like, fine. you have a camera, right? To me. They were like, you have a camera? I'm like, I have a camera. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, you are an Emmy Award-winning screenwriter for television. Three times. Three. Three times. Three. <laughs> yeah. Best known for Robot Chicken. Yes. So Only, you know a little bit only about known for Robot Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, you know your way around a keyboard, don't you? I've, I've seen a few keyboards, yes. All right. So tonight we're going to do something that we rarely do, which is doing a story breakdown and the story breakdown that we'll be doing tonight, Mike, is of The Breakfast Club. Yay! Now, typically, you don't do any preparation for the show, but tonight you felt like you were going to do a little bit. Tonight, it was a movie that I, I do remember enjoying, and I was like, oh, well, it's a movie, so I don't have to really do much. I just got to put it on and watch, and I was like, that's easy enough. So, yeah, I actually prepared. Why is your audio out of sync? Is somebody else on your Wi-Fi at the same time? No, we're on, I'm unplugged in. I got You're the plug unplugged in. in. Don't use those big words around me, Mike. <laughs> I, got the, I got the plug in. I, wa I watched the role of Alex Winters in The Breakfast Club and did Randy Quaid turn into a two-faced monster. I think you may have seen the wrong movie, Glenn. I, I don't know the, the Randy Quaid part. I don't know either. Randy Quaid was in Vacation, which was also written by John Hughes. Huh. Huh. Right? Alex What's Winters it? was in uh, Bill and Ted. Bill and he Ted. He was also in... Um... The Lost Boys. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Good. Wait, that was Freak. I never saw Freak. So close, Glenn. Yeah. The Breakfast Club. <laughs> Sounds almost exactly the same. Yeah, I, I could see how you made that mistake. <laughs> All right. So, Mike, um, in preparation for the show, uh, we both rewatched the movie. Mm -hmm. I got mine out of the public library. Where'd you, how'd you watch it? Um, I'm not going to tell you how I watched it because you'll get mad. Oh, did, please don't tell me you watched a pirated. <laughs> I I watched it on a on a site that wasn't a, a usual streamer. Okay. Um. So it was. Right. It was so, free. It was there. So Mike, uh, the Breakfast Club. We saw it when we were in high school. The actors uh, were also in high school. It was very much a coming of age movie. Very popular. Did you like it when it first came out? When it first came out, I remember enjoying it. Yes. Um, on this rewatch, I was like, I remember certain parts that I did enjoy, but overall I was, I'd give it a meh. A solid meh? A solid, solid meh. Solid meh. Mike Fasolo, solid meh. <laughs> okay, so I thought it was a decent movie when I saw it. Uh, later years, I thought it was better. I thought it aged well when they re-released mm. it. Uh, interesting to note, The Breakfast Club did not open to rave reviews. It did not do very well. Um, it was considered a little bit talky and I, oh, look at that. Nice it to see you too. When I did. So when, when I went back to rewatch it, I, I have to tell you, Mike, one of the things that I observed was it is not of today's political correctness standards. Oh no, no. We're, <laughs> not, we're not saying that we are endorsing the whole movie. What we are saying is we are going to study it from a, uh, a writing perspective. So yes. uh, what we talk about, Mike, is really focused on the writing portion. Yes, the structure. The structure. So uh, I feel like 
Oh, there's Ari. Ari is uh, Ari's hey, joined Ari. us tonight. You know, Ari just won yet another award for writing. Oh, congratulations, yeah. Ari. Yeah, look at that. Ari won another award. We'll get into that a little bit later. But Mike, I, I've put together a little story analysis, and I'll need your help going through it. What do you think? Okay, go. I'm ready. All right. So we're going to share a, uh, a screen, which I have prepared here for you, you got the in right PowerPoint, button. because who doesn't love PowerPoint? Everyone loves PowerPoint. Everybody loves PowerPoint. Everyone. So, uh, from the perspective of what comic book creators can learn from the Breakfast Club, intriguing? No, it is. I was I was intrigued last week, and I'm still intrigued. Yeah, you were intrigued. You were like, "What are we doing? <laughs> what, what literally? What are we doing?" So Ari did win an award, and redheaded is congratulating him. So, first thing, Mike, let's just talk about what is the movie about. Okay. So, uh, the Breakfast Club is a 1985 American teen coming of age comedy drama film. That tells the story of five teenagers from different high school cliques who serve a Saturday detention overseen by their authoritarian vice principal. That pretty much yeah, that's, uh, summarizes that's it. Yeah. Oh, I guess Redheaded Ed doesn't like PowerPoint. Um, so I, I think like any story, Mike, uh, a, a good log line will go a long way. It doesn't necessarily match uh, the copy that's at the top of the poster, but it doesn't really matter. What you need to know is this is a story told in one room. It's a single set piece. Uh, it's a, like a play almost, yeah, right? I, I honestly talking. didn't even didn't even think of that single room. It's, yeah, it's one room, basically. Huh. Um, backstory on that. John Hughes had written uh, a couple of movies that did well, and they gave him an opportunity to direct, and they gave him a very tiny budget, and they needed to have only one location, which they shot in a high school in Illinois. Interesting to note, little uh, little trivia there, that he was also shooting B-roll uh, for the Ferris Bueller movie at the same time. Ah, does oh. Ferris Bueller take place in Shermer, Illinois? I don't know, but interesting thing enough, it, the movie was 85, and it supposedly took place in 84. Hmm. So most movies go a little bit ahead. They went one year behind. Um, but they were telling the story of 80s high school students, and it felt fairly accurate. And the students were essentially, uh, this is your cast, John Hughes, legendary writer, director, um, a lot of big talent that was getting their first break, big break, right? Big names, big names. Big names. And, well, not and big names then, big names now. Big names now. And and certainly, um, I have a favorite. I'm not sure who your, your favorite is. Do you have a favorite of uh, the characters? Uh, I liked uh, Anthony and Michael Hall's character. You did. Did you relate yeah. to him? Were you uh, the, the was nerdy? I a brain? No. Were you the brain? No. No. <laughs> no. I, you I, know, I, but I was more the jock, obviously. Yeah, I think everybody <laughs> could relate a little to each one of the characters, right? Yeah. They were, even though they were archetypes, everybody tries out different uh, roles in high school. I think, um, but I, I think my favorite character of all uh, was played by Ali Sheedy. I really enjoyed her. She was uh, she had brought so much charm to the role, um, but these were the characters. This is um, the uh, the lineup, and we'll take them one by one, Mike, and we'll talk about archetypes. But first, before they be, we do that, Mike, um, can you explain what is an archetype in writing? It's it's basically, um, I guess, kind of what you would expect from the character, like. In the case of Anthony Michael Hall, he was the brain of the crew. So he did all the smart stuff. He had, you know, the, the some funny good lines. He was the the brainy, and he's exactly what you would expect from a brainy nerd character. Now, what um, John Hughes does very well with all of his characters is he dresses them visually as you would expect them. So each one wore clothing that was indicative of their character, right? They didn't break out of their archetypes, at least in the beginning of the movie. So let's just go through the archetypes. So, oops, I'm oh, not sharing my screen. The, oh, you didn't it would get help. I'm going through the slides push, like crazy. Push the button. <laughs> yeah, I'm going through the slides like crazy. I'm like, these are great. Um, okay, so Anthony Michael Hall, the brain. Uh, what, what, what about Anthony Michael Hall uh, would you say were characteristics of his character that were archetypical? Uh, well, his clothing was very kind of bland, very mm -hmm. nerdy. He was uh, distanced from the others because mm -hmm. he was the smart, the smart one. And everyone was like, oh, he's just a nerd. So why pay attention to him? 
Had a weird I, haircut. Weird haircut. Good. Okay. Next one, the athlete. Talk to me about the athlete, Mike. Uh, Emilio Estevez. I didn't really think he fit the the model of an athlete because at one time he takes off his shirt and I was like, he's not really that cut. But anyway, he was the jock, um, you know, wrestling team, kind of a tough guy, wanted to kind of, you know, kind of show who he was every now and then when he got in a, a argument with uh, Judd Nelson. So he was, he was like the, yeah, well, there's Allie. She now, was they, the, interestingly enough, her character was called the basket case. Yeah. That was I a think weird she, name, the basket well, case. She didn't have any friends as she admitted in the thing. And she was just weird. Like she didn't talk for the probably half of the movie, half the movie, at least. Yeah. Um, and yeah, she just, you know, stayed mostly to herself. Everyone thought she was so weird that they didn't want anything to do with her. And she, you know, had that big parka on and she just kind of hid inside it. And one of the things I noted about her was while the other characters were mostly colorful, she was mostly monochromatic, mostly black and white. And there was even a shot where she's wearing filthy sneakers. So, you know, she was <laughs> that kid, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Molly Ringwald, the princess. She was the rich bitch of the crew. Um, very high and mighty. Her parents were very well off and she was uh, given everything. She was even at the beginning, they're like she's talking to her father. She's like, couldn't you get me out of this? Right. I don't, you never find out what she did. Uh, we did. It. Actually, Didn't we you? did. She skipped school to go shopping. Oh, I don't remember that part. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and she was cast as the beauty. That was yeah. her, her cast. Whoops. And then. Judd Nelson. He was the criminal. Yeah. He was the, the tough kid. The. The one who broke all the rules, uh, the wise ass, didn't didn't really want to be there. You know, everybody knew one of them. The I criminal. was like okay. him mostly. And oh, okay, let's see. This is uh, something that redheaded. Had. The movie was made when nerds were still bullied. Yeah, like that's gone away. <laughs> but I agree. I agree. It's it's yeah. cool to be a geek. Okay, the movie was made when nerds were still bullies and weirdos were disassociated from most groups. It's so different now. Crazy. Um, yeah, I would say that, yeah, culturally things have changed quite a yeah. bit. All right, so here's what we're going to do, Mike. So we're going to look at the main characters. So I've stacked them like this. You can see that even in uh, the screenshots that I pulled, uh, they are color-coded. Mm -hmm. And interesting to note the color coding, okay? So as we think about storytelling, Mike, we're going to break this down into a three-act structure. Ooh, but the first thing I'd like that. to do is set, yeah, here we go. So when characters are created, you do a backstory on them. Am I right? You are, yes. You, you're right. You're, you're trying to figure out where they want to go. What is their direction? And each one of these characters is currently moving in a direction. They are trying to go in their direction, but that's when we hit the inciting incident. Mike, what's an inciting incident? That's the thing that gets the, the movie moving. You know, it could be, oh, this is the... You know, you found the map to the legend of whatever, and that's that gets everything pushed forward. And what is the inciting incident in this? Do you would you say uh, it's them all getting detention? Yeah, they all got detention, so they were all forced to be uh, in the same room on a Saturday. Did you ever have to go for Saturday detention? I had never to go Saturday. Once. We just ours was always once. just after school. Yours was after school. I did one Saturday, and I went to uh, all boys Catholic high school, Mike, and our detention was called. Um, Saturday Jug. Did you ever hear of Saturday Jug? <laughs> I did not hear of Saturday and Jug. And it, it, I checked up the history of it because I was like, what did Jug mean? And, and um, it was justice under God. Oh, nice. Justice under God. I like that. Oh, Joe Kalinowski. My favorite was Principal Dick Vernon. Your mind bender. I've got you for two months. Two months. Yes. Two months, right? Mess with the bull, you get the horns. You get the horns. Okay, so... We are now looking at the characters, and you're not sure. So now we say again. they're on their trajectory. They are going where they want to go. But oh. what's happened is their trajectory towards the inciting incident is not all. Oh wait, the inciting incident equals the point of no return. Well done, Philip Burnett. Philip is a comic book creator and somebody very smart in he our group. So doing. yeah, he's good. It was way different. Yeah, my Saturday <laughs> jug was not very pleasant. We didn't we didn't do fun things. We dug a hole. You dug holes. Yeah. We got dressed in our school uniform. Uh, for the first half of jug, we dug a hole in the garden. 
And then the second half was replanting all the plants and covering the garden as it, and then you weren't done until it was done. So that was my Saturday jug experience. So they're heading toward the inciting in incident. What do you notice about the arrows, Mike? They've gone askew. They are going in different directions because each of these people are going in different directions. Now, the inciting incident and the villain of this is, of course, the vice principal. Now, he has set up this inciting incident. And when they get to this inciting incident, they begin character conflict. Now, the thing about the character conflict, Mike, that's really important is when lines are moving in a straight direction and they collide into each other, what happens? There's problems. There's problems, right? The lines, if, if, especially if you continue this trajectory, will at some point smash into each other. Each one of these lines wants to continue its own direction, but it cannot because of the inciting incident. It has created conflict. Character conflict. I like Character that. You, conflict. You real conflict that. because each one of them has to fulfill their requirements. They all want to be done with it. And yet here they are unable to do that and unable to get along for the eight hour time. Now, so if we look at this in act one, I look at, right? I made graphics. I wonder is, how redheaded like... Ed thinks about this. So <laughs> in act one, we begin our inciting incident and we get an establishment of the two villains. Now, the, the principal is the clear villain in this, right? He is, he's representative of an authority figure, yes. but Bender is also He's also a villain. Am I right? Would, how, would you characterize Bender as a villain to the group? Yes, he is definitely a villain to the group. He because is all he does. Yes, all he does is argue. And he says he's just talking about the truth, but he's just poking at everybody, just trying to get them agitated. Right. He's trying to agitate them. And he doesn't really want to be liked. Mm which is an important aspect of this. And he is a, an opposing view in a world where everybody wants to conform. So the first scene that I think is emblematic and important for us to watch together, Mike, is this scene with the um, uh, lunch. And what I want everybody to take a look at is how each person's lunch represents who they are and watch their interactions and watch how Bender interacts with each one of the characters and it's 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 worth noting. I'm not giving anything away here. He Spoiler. doesn't have his own lunch, right? He didn't have his own lunch. So watch this clip. What's in there? Guess. Where's your lunch? You're wearing it. You're nauseating. What's that? Sushi. Sushi? <laughs> Rice, uh, raw fish, and seaweed. You won't accept a guy's tongue in your mouth and you're gonna eat that? Can I eat? I don't know. Give it a try. What's your problem?
What are we having? Uh, it's just your standard regular lunch, I guess. Milk? Soup. Yeah. Oh, that's apple juice. I can read. P, B, and J with the crusts cut off. Well, Brian, this is a very nutritious lunch. All the food groups are represented. Did your mom marry Mr. Rogers? Uh, no, Mr. Johnson. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it was a little choppy, but I think what it did was it set the scene um, and each character, each archetype had a certain type of lunch. Mike, tell me about the archetypical lunch. Well, the, the thing, uh, I'll go through the lunches because uh, this is actually a very good question. I saw that before. Is he a villain or an antagonist? I would actually probably classify him more as an antagonist. An antagonist? Okay. Yeah. I, I, I would agree with uh, Redheaded Ed on this. I, I do think she was correct. I, I, I was putting him in as an archetypical villain, um, but I think that that's, that's uh, very valid. Now, Ar Aristotle defined, and I think Ari actually knows Aristotle. <laughs> Aristotle defined the middle act as protasis. Especially when you're using words like that, which no one Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I went for a protasis exam and I was fine. Uh, the tangling of the threads, which makes the plot literally thicken. Oh, I like that. Mm. That is cool, Ari. Um, catharsis is the cutting of the threads, which releases all the tension. Gee, oh, my goodness. Yeah, he knows what he's talking about. Redhead says she was the uh, weirdo. Um, anybody getting diabetes from looking at the weird That's, girls? It, I bet hers tasted the best. Out of I bet it was awesome because yeah. it was Captain Crunch <laughs> on a sandwich. I was like, that with is Dixie okay. sticks. Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, I don't know I, what was wrong with that. <laughs> All right, so that's right. Uh, diabetes didn't affect you in the '80s if you were in a John Hughes film. Okay, so Mike, um, what can we learn from our lunches and the way John Bender, the antagonist? is reacting to each of them. Well, so the princess had, of course, sushi, which doesn't make any sense because you wouldn't bring sushi to sit in a bag at your feet for three or four hours because it would just spoil. But besides that, that's but the... But it was the, an archetypical yes, thing, that's right? the high and mighty type of lunch. Like someone very rich would only be eating sushi. And, you know, even being a teenager, she's in that upper crust sort of world. Uh, the athlete had an athlete's lunch. You knew he yeah. was burning calories, right? Yeah, he, he had three, sam three, I would guess, turkey sandwiches, a bag probably. of cookies, which was great, and a bag of chips. He had yeah. milk, too, which you wouldn't have just brought and let sit in the, <laughs> in the bag there. So, in the room and around. then what I thought was great was there is this weird connection throughout the film between Judd and Allie, right? He, mm -hmm. he just hurls the soda, and she's just like, yep. <laughs> right? <laughs> They have a weird connection throughout the movie because they are both outcasts for different reasons and skewing on the scale of highly acceptable to unacceptable. They relate to each other, even though they don't speak much to either. Right. Good point. Good point. And then he bullies the nerd, basically. Right. He just takes it because he's not going to bully the, 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 the athlete. Yeah. He is not going to eat sushi. <laughs> and he just leaves the. Uh, the basket case alone. So, yeah. but I, what I think is the archetypes now have meals that are archetypical to their character. So, yes, so that's what I really wanted to get to. Okay. So let's continue on with the learning, Mike. Okay. So they've now eaten, eaten lunch. We've hit the midpoint of act two, right? Mm -hmm. Act one is uh, one quarter. Act two is 50%. Act three is one quarter, right? That's the theory behind the three act. Act two is twice as large. And then there is a twist in the middle. So, um, sorry, the epsasis is in the middle. It goes protasis, epsasis, catharsis. I'm not that smart after all. I wouldn't even understand. know those words to be. Yeah. You don't even know them and you've won three Emmys. If you understood those words, you are very smart. You are very smart. Okay. So now they're heading to the, to the midpoint. And what's happened during this, including the fact that Bender has done some mischievous things like taking the screw out of the door. What's happened is they have now not necessarily, and I was saying he was a villain, he was an antagonist, but he is, he is changing. And, and you can see that Molly Wing, Ringwald's character is, is facing an attraction towards him. Now he's still at great odds with the athlete, but he's not at odds with the basket case. And he's really not at odds with the nerd. He kind of leaves the nerd alone. He yeah. just, 
you know, razzes them a little bit, but the villain consistently is still the principal, right? Yes. Okay. But what's happened here, and you can see what I'm doing with the arrows, the arrows are getting less tangled here in the second half of act one. They're sort of compressing in a way where they are um, lining up a little bit, right? Because they've had no choice, right? They're stuck in a single room set. They have to get along and they have to do something. They actually had to, they had an assignment from the principal. Do you remember what the assignment was? They had to write an essay on who they were. Who they were, who you think you are, who, who you, you, are. you are. A 1,000 word essay. So uh, during this, nobody's written a word, right? <laughs> nobody's, they're just, it's all just shenanigans. And I throw that out for my friend, Joe Kalinowski. There were shenanigans. Now, the next major scene is what turns Bender from being a criminal into the hero. All right. So let's just look at that scene. Hopefully it's not quite as choppy. Uh, by the way, um, I've cut this scene for time and also had to drop the music. So it'll seem a little unusual when you're... So what you hear is jaunty music right now, Mike. It's, you know, da -da -dum -da -dum. they're doing it's like a chase scene sort of thing. And uh, now they've reached the end and they're trapped. We're dead. No. Just me. What do you mean? Get back to the library. Keep you doing it on. All right, Mike. So this is a this is a really important uh, moment. Talk to me about the importance of this moment and what just happened. The turning point because he sacrifices himself for the group. Now, now, what what does that do for the team Shen shenanigans? <laughs> what does that do for the team, Mike? It, it, it's gonna definitely gonna bring the team closer together and make them not look at him as such a, a douchebag. They're like he did this to save the rest of us. That's right. So. They all went willingly out into the hallway and then they went to his locker and what he pushes down Michael Anthony Hall's pants is, is a large bag of marijuana, right? And he knows that he can't get caught with it. Nobody can. But also they have symbolically hit the end of the line. The fun and shenanigans are over and they are about to be discovered. And he sacrifices himself and not just in a little way, in a big way, right? He, he, yes. he, and now he has actually turned as a character into what I would say is the leader of the group. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree right? with that. So he is now, I don't know if I would go as a Christ. <laughs> maybe not year. that far, but you know, <laughs> maybe an apostle. <laughs> maybe. I don't, I, yeah, he is definitely <laughs> sacrificing himself, but. Um, I wouldn't say quite that much, but I would say that he is like the team leader. He has um, taken this motley group and brought them together with his sacrifice. And they realize that. And then he gets locked up and is uh, in big trouble. Okay. So now they are a team of heroes. And in Act 3, watch. I know it's a little small. Let me see if I can do this when it's just full screen. Hold on. Let me see if I know how to work the buttons. Okay. Now you can see... <laughs> that these arrows on the right are all aligned, Mike. They are all lined up, essentially, in the same direction, right? They are now a team, and they are aligned against the true villain, which is the vice principal. Yes. What Are you, are you tracking? This is making all I'm, sense? I'm tracking this. I like how this works. This is good. Yeah, you like how this works. Okay. So now, what happens at the end is change in characters. Um, first, we have the basket case. As, as I noted earlier, uh, very monochromatic, very uh, symbolic of somebody who is, um, you know, not trying to be, you know, the most popular person. Literally has accepted it. But she has the most dramatic, what I would say, visual change. 
what happens to her here, Mike? Uh, well, first of all, before even even that visual change, they have a little group gathering. Yeah. And they all reveal themselves a little bit. Yeah. Like she admits she has no friends and yada yada yada. But then um uh she becomes, you know, friends with uh Molly Ringwald's character and Molly gives her a makeover to make her not such a weirdo, not so monochromatic. I would agree. And I think that that's an important moment because they begin to reveal the real reasons why they are in detention. And each one of them has put on a front as to why they're in detention. But now we can see that the real reason they're in detention is a multi-layered approach. And interestingly enough to note, each one of them was in detention, except yeah, <laughs> she just showed not, up. She, yeah, it was weird. She was just there. She was just there. And uh oh, this is Glenn Gotella. They this is where I start to dislike the movie. All right. Well, I, I didn't say that we were endorsing the movie and that you should like it. For sure, there are a lot of flaws in this movie. Yeah. And 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 you know, Bender does some actions that are, are really just even inappropriate, even for then. And we think about um, you know, this was playing around the same same time movies like Porky's was playing, mm -hmm. right? So I think they were going for sometimes of an aesthetic, but uh, Bender is hard to redeem. Yeah. You know what I mean? He is pretty hard to redeem, but, um, this is, this is very symbolic too. This is very symbolic. Uh, when, when Ali Sheedy's character goes from dark to light, mm -hmm. right? Character evolution. Those clothes? I have no idea where I, I right? Like, where did she have those clothes? Did she just, did someone have them in a bag and they fit her perfectly? And she had that headband. Like I could see, potentially Molly Ringwald's character having a makeup bag makes it, but having that whole outfit with her. Yeah. And her whole, her hair is completely done. Like yeah. quaffed it up, quaffed it up. And quaffed you know, it. she's still wearing the dirty sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to tell, but um, okay. So visually she makes a symbolic change when she joins the team, not saying that we're endorsing this, but I'm saying as you're thinking about being a comic book writer and you're thinking about team dynamics, Sometimes a character changes when they're in the team, okay? So now we go back to the team. Now, in the end, uh, one of the big uh, reveals was this letter, this uh, essay that they were supposed to um, write. Mm -hmm. And in Act 3, I contend that they defeated their enemy, the villain, with this letter. Want to talk about that, Mike? What what did the letter say, and how did it defeat the villain? The letter was basically telling him that he has put them in their own, you know, archetypical categories. This is how you saw us, but that is not who we are, and you were wrong. And you were wrong. And really, what they also acknowledge in this is you will always see us like this, and that's all we'll ever be to you, but we are more than that. And this is the moment where the villain is defeated – um, I cropped this shot a little bit, but this is a very wide shot. And oh, hold on. Oh, okay. That's that that that's actually a good point. She could uh, have had multiple outfits in a bag or in a locker close by. Okay, that's fair. Maybe in a locker, that's yeah, fair. that's true. That's fair. That's fair. I was never a teenage girl. <laughs> Are you sure? I should try. Um, <laughs> but the defeat of the villain was symbolic of two things, Mike. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, that it ended where it began in this room that is his essential prison and punishment room. And now the room is completely clean, vacated, and he stands alone with this evidence that he could not defeat them when they work together as a team. Individually, he beat John Bender. Individually, he told Anthony Michael Hall to shut up. Individually, he dismissed what Molly Ringwald. And individually... Ali Sheedy's character, he didn't even know who she was. <laughs> and didn't even realize she wasn't supposed to be there. So the villain gets his ultimate comeuppance when he realizes that the assignment that he gave them for punishment has literally changed them and backfired. It did not work at all in the way he intended. That's some good thinking, bud. That's some good thinking. Okay, so good thinking. let's see where we go. So for comic book writers, Mike, we are talking with a comic book writer author um, audience. So we look at this. So you're a screenwriter. Talk to me as a screenwriter about the acts and how they work and just do a quick summary for me. Uh, well, the act one sets everything up, uh, pulls in the inciting incident, gets everything 
in in the order that it needs to be sets mm -hmm. up the characters and the plot act two is where you learn the most about the characters what they want to do where they're going and of course you have the big um the big moment where one of the characters or even all of them they could have changed from what they were to what they are going to become all right let's zoom and, in on this how accurate would you say my analysis is of the lines and the character trajectories? Would you agree? Would you say the lines were a little bit different? Or would you say that in terms of this story, this is kind of you would agree with? In terms of this story, I would give this two thumbs up. Two thumbs up. Two, two. thumbs up. Not just one, two. So yeah, I agree. So act one, act two, and act three really do play through in a classic structure. And that was one yeah. of the things about John Hughes. He, he wrote with a classic structure and he could take archetypes and then twist them. So what he did with each one of these archetypes is he represented that each one of these archetypes indeed were multi-layered individuals, exactly who would, <laughs> Cisco, they would be <laughs> proud. So um, they were and that was what John Hughes was saying, right? The, under the pressure of authority, trying to fit in. And yet, once they got to know each other and they let their guard down and they worked together, um, they literally, you know, came to see each other as other human beings and not just archetypes because they saw each other as archetypes yes. as well. And that was important. Yeah. It wasn't just the vice principal. It was it was them themselves that saw each other as architects. Yeah, that was one of the uh, things that they discussed in their little group setting, like how they see each other. And, uh, you know, one of the questions was, I think Anthony Michael Hall asked, he's like, if I come up and talk to you tomorrow, what's, what's your reaction going to be? And they still were fitting into their archetypes and the, like Molly Ringwell is like, I wouldn't talk to you. And then by the end of things, you know, you know that Everything they would. Comes around. Yeah. All right. So now let's take a look at what happens in our denouement. 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 I, actually had to, I had to look that up because I spelled it wrong. Okay. <laughs> You're saying um, it wrong too. <laughs> real quick. Um, if you look at the DVD, I got the, uh, yeah, I got the DVD version. Um, the way they break down the scenes, it, it kind of follows the structure of a three act structure. So the first six, major scenes break down as act one act two kind of breaks down in a predictable way until they get to a ruckus and then um you see the final act three and the denouement uh all pulled together right and in the dance scene uh where they dance i think one of the um things is group therapy you see the name? Yep, that's the, yeah, that's the big one. Group therapy. We are not alone. That was their dance sequence where they danced the song. We are not alone. And then sincerely yours, the breakfast club, right? That is the defeat of the villain. And then end titles, which uh, play to the song. Don't you forget about me. So the clues are there. Now, if you're thinking about a structure of a story, you could actually look at this and see this now there was a very interesting role uh the custodial artist um the custodian uh i would say is the philosopher king mm -hmm. and in the scenes where the, the philosopher king influences each group and uh, what is this typical meme well i'm glad we were able to see that url there <laughs> there you go not see okay um but the philosopher king spoke both with the principal and extorted money from him yep <laughs> and to the students and told them i run this school and somebody uh, my friend liam had told me he said if you look in one of the scenes the custodian is in a photo in one of the scenes where he was the head the the all-star basketball huh. guy and then he goes back to the school and becomes the custodian that's interesting. A little Easter egg. A little Easter egg. But what, what role would you say that the custodian plays? Because he's not a main character, but he does have a very important aspect of the story. What, what is He would role? be, you know, I would relate him to the sort of the silent Bob of the of the movie where he has fantastic insights. But he's, you know, kind of a distance as well. Like you don't really expect much from him. But then when he starts talking to you, you know that he knows what he's talking about. 
Interesting to note that he's a custodian who would consider to be lower on the social strata, right, of yep. careers. And then he's with the vice principal, he's near the top, and yet he is much wiser than anybody gives him credit for. The, the, the student, especially Bender, tries to razz him. But in the end, you will see that the philosopher king is uh, there when they emerge as a team. So let me show you what that looks like. All right, so we're going to stop screen. We're going to share screen. Getting better at this, huh? Uh, Not as, all right, I'll say, I'm, I feel like I'm getting better at this. Um, but anyway, you read the, the titles and it gives you some insights. Now, uh, comparing this to superhero stories, often early superhero team books were established by putting the characters in conflict. That is, they either didn't know who they were, uh, they were set by the enemy to fight a battle. Um, there was some conflict that got them to fight each other. But then as they saw that the true villain was actually the villain of the story, you know, pretty archetypical, they united, joined forces to defeat the villain. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's that's great. That's That's exactly how it should be done. And that's what has been done for many, many years in comics. They, so they, early comics, before Stanley and Jack Kirby revamped the event, you know, built the Avengers, Fantastic Four, X Men, uh, the superheroes were like, "We're superheroes. We're all work together," you know. And it was that was why people were not as excited about the comics. It didn't it didn't uh, thrill as much. What he did was he took characters that might not get along. They were different types of characters. If you look at the Avengers, right, you have Ant Man and Wasp. They're small. Iron Man, he's powerful. Hulk is out of control. You know, Thor is superior. Spider-Man versus the X-Men, right? They might get together and not be friends. You know, the yeah. Teen Titans fighting Batman. Here are all these characters, and you want to know why are they fighting and why aren't they fighting the villain? And this is a perfect structure for comic book writers who can look at the archetypes in The Breakfast Club and get a good sense of how to tell an effective story. So, once again, we come back. The log line, Mike, is interesting. It's a film that tells the story of five teenagers from different high school cliques who serve a Saturday detention overseen by their authoritarian, authoritarian vice principal. Now that we've reviewed it, this is a good log line, but really, that's not what the story is all about, is it? I don't know. I, I think it is, because it is a coming-of-age story for all of them. I would say that's the plot. But the real story is these characters learning that they don't have to be their own archetypes and that they they can actually relate to one another despite the fact that they visually look different, they have different backgrounds, and really in the end, if they gave each other a chance, they might be friends or they might fall in love. And I think that, yes, as a plot, when people start thinking about a story, they think about the plot. But what this did was it said, this is the setup. The real story was the evolution of these characters. Mm, I like that. That's deep. That is deep. So let's go a little bit deeper. Here's what we can learn. So we had five individuals are brought together by an inciting inf incident, right? Mm -hmm. So your story needs to have some reason why the characters have come together. So you have an inciting incident. Second is the conflicts are based on the trajectory, right? You're not automatically, when you're in detention, in a fight with people. The conflict was based on each one of them was going in different directions. For example, Emilio Estevez's character wanted to get through this so that he can go back and not miss his wrestling meet. Yes. Right? These were the kinds of things. So their trajectories, whereas uh, Bender had no place else to be, right? And neither did uh, Ali Sheedy. But yeah. that was a conflict, right? He just wanted to get through it as quickly as possible. And Molly Ringwald just thought, well, you know, I'm not even supposed to be here. All right. There was the escalation of tension. That is Bender, as uh, Redheaded Ed rightfully points out. Um, the escalation really happens during lunch where he is an antagonist disruptor. He's, yeah, well, he's a disruptor the whole time. The whole time. But he really, he gets, he tries to get under people's skin. Right. He is just an antagonist. He can't yes. help it. Yes. Um, they're trapped by the villain. When they when we see that scene, they run and they hit the cage. They are symbolically, even if they leave that room, they are still trapped, Mike. That's good. That's a good one. I didn't even think right. of that. 
sacrifice that unites. Bender sacrifices himself, the heroic moment of the movie. But there is another heroic moment, or several, and I should say that. Then the team works together to overcome the villain. They all evolve from start to end. And in the end, the villain, I said of one of the villains, I should maybe revise it. Antagonist. Antagonist becomes the hero. And in the end, he is the final character that you see on screen. He is. He's and he is the... triumphant, right? He's got the yep. fist. Okay. Philip Burnett says, it, it's kind of a unification story coming together through common adversity. Yep. The Dirty Dozen has a similar plot thread in the first three quarters of the movie. The one thing I will say is different about the uh, Dirty Dozen, Mike, uh, on that they have guns. They do. They do have lots of guns. So, <laughs> so... I, I would agree with Philip Burnett. It's like Breakfast Club with guns. <laughs> Actually, what's interesting was Anthony Michael Hall's character. Do you remember why he was put into detention? Uh, he had a gun in school. He brought a gun in school. He got an he brought F. A gun, but I see, and this is I didn't I didn't watch it, you know, that closely. But I think he said it was a flare gun because it, was it a went flare off. gun. Like, where does one get a flare gun? Yeah, yeah. So apparently, he was he was thinking of uh, suicide, but he brought a flare gun because he brought a flare I guess gun. That would work. Eat a flare. Um, so Glenn Gotella says this is the 2012 Avengers with different characters. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We all brought them together. So um, I would agree uh, with all those things. And he, and each of them was in there for different reasons. Bender pulled a fire alarm. Uh, Burnett, actually, he's correct. Less people die in the Breakfast Club naturally. Thank you. <laughs> Got the, there's an elevator pitch, the breakfast club with guns. You that know was, what, Ari, yeah. you go write that. Award-winning Ari should write that one. <laughs> so uh, I like that. Um, okay, so now we've got the denouement. Say it, Mike. Denouement. Denouement. What's interesting is they symbolically passed the custodian, the philosopher king. When they leave, you never see them leave the principal. Yeah, that's true. They leave the room and the principal's left alone in the room. In the denouement, you see them walk and they could be literally the Avengers. Now right? they were a, a group. Now, a team. group. now the positioning of um kid in my class got in trouble having sent. How did he fit it? How, How did he fit it? it in a locker? So, okay, so here's the thing. What's interesting? Anthony Michael Hall, very Captain America pose, bright yellow uh, uh, scarf, leading the way out. He has emerged as one of the leaders, <laughs> right? Yep. Behind him are the two cliques. Molly and Judd have, have uh, become a relationship, and Emilio and Ali have become a relationship. And that's how big these actors became, that we don't even call them their character names. <laughs> we just call them their actors' names. So hold on, but there are so many of these, even seven samurai. Oh, yeah. The groups yeah. are learning; they are more than individuals, and they thought they were, exactly. Yeah, it's they are more team. than just the individuals. They they are now a team, mm -hmm. and we will see that in in the denouement for uh, each of these characters. So let's take a look. By the way, I did want to note uh, they are passing the custodian who says, "I run this school." He is the philosopher king, and when he they pass that threshold. From the school to outside of the school, they are symbolically taking the next steps in their relationship and extending the relationship from the school to real life. Hmm. Interesting. Ari explains that they had lockers big enough for samurai swords. Yeah, I had a full height locker, yeah. Yeah, all right. I went to Catholic school. We did not. Okay. <laughs> so as part of his denouement, he gains acceptance, friendship, and trust, things that he never had. One of the turning points in this is when Molly Ringwald says, you're the smartest of our group. Why don't you write the essay? And the thing that she says to him is extremely important. We trust you. We trust you. Mm -hmm. And when he writes the essay, his feeling of satisfaction is that he was now accepted and they agreed that they would continue to be friends and even though they've paired off there was five of them he has found the acceptance in the group again he's walking out first he is leading them out of the situation what do you think mike i think that's good these are things i never would have picked up i don't know what this what is it lucky it wasn't a magin naginata what is that is that a type of a sword it's a it's a naginata it's an agonata. 
I, uh, there are people far smarter than us in this entire conversation, Mike, and we're just going to have to Google, go to dictionary.com. Okay. So he gains in the end, his character evolution is he has gained the trust of the, the group and he has written the letter that is ultimately their voice. He has spoken mm -hmm. for all of them. Um, both of them are now viewed from the inside. So symbolically, Ali's character was on the inside, this character who just needed an opportunity to come out. Now, whether or not, you know, it's too symbolic or it doesn't play well today, that is the point of this particular story. We put no judgment on it, but they both wanted to be seen from the inside. Now, the pressure that Emilio was put under was from his father. His father was boys will be boys, go cause some shenanigans. And he taped that poor kid's butt together and he didn't feel good about that. He was he was okay being an athlete, but he didn't feel good about hurting another kid. And he was now allowed to let that out. And of course, um, when she leaves, she rips his letter off of his sleeve, symbol symbolically changing who he is and the armor that he wears. She takes part of that armor, and now they are a team. What do you think? Look at you go, bud. That's awesome. Right on, baby. Okay, last but not least, um, they are both more than just archetypes. When he was picking on Claire about being a virgin, she was trying to say, I'm more than that. She was really frustrated by the fact that he pushed her into the corner. And they both had a mutual attraction, but neither of them could cross that barrier until, until she visited him in prison. Mm -hmm. Right? Then they were more than archetypes. Once they, they were away from the group, once they were moved out of judgmental eyes, they got to say, this is who we are. Now, the one thing also, everybody talks about the visual change in Ali Sheedy's character. The other visual change is Bender. Throughout this, he is dressed like the criminal or what, what when in high school we, we might have called the dirt bag. Right? <laughs> Look at the coat he has on now. That's like a tweed coat, and he's got a scarf that's hanging over. He has literally covered up that other part of his character and is now somebody else. So hmm. he has visually changed much conversation about Ali Sheedy going from dark to light. But John Bender now looks like a guy that could be somewhat normal. Right. Like he has now covered up. If we look at all the outfits that he has worn prior to this, let's just jump back for a minute. Look at he's wearing the, the denim jacket. Let's see if we can find. Yeah, look, see, you see the, the, the outfit that he's wearing there? He's yep. got the cutoff finger gloves, which he still has. He's got the T-shirt. The he's got the flannel. He's got the, the jacket. But now we come forward and look at him now. He doesn't look as harsh, right? No. He, of course, he's wearing clothes to be outside in Illinois, but he's also not as harsh. He looks like less of a criminal. He looks a little bit more <laughs> like he wants to be accepted. Yeah. He wants to be more than his uh, his archetype. So we're almost done. I could never pull off the hanky around the shoe look. Um, I'm sorry, Joe. I don't know what um, that means. He means the bandanas. Oh, oh, hanky. Hanky. They call it. He's Joe's from Cleveland. He's from the Midwest, or <laughs> actually, he was from Pittsburgh, and then. But I think the key thing is um, he was cool for for the time. He wore the cool clothes. Now, last but not least, Bender goes from villain to hero. His character evolution, all he wanted to be was accepted, but he didn't know how to be accepted. Symbolic, they're playing the song, Don't You Forget About Me. But the other symbolism is look at the location. Football stadium. Football stadium. He's walking across the symbolic field where the athletes would compete. He would never compete. But now <laughs> he literally walked across it, raised his fist in victory for the song, Don't You Forget About Me. He has not really changed who he is, but his victory was that he was also accepted and he couldn't admit it. And they all knew it. They all knew he was like a crusty, tough guy on the outside, but was soft and smushy in the middle. <laughs> and, and at that point, he evolves from villain into hero.
Nice. I never would have, again, never would have even caught that. Yeah, the location is important, right? Clear skies, and he is, you know, don't you forget about me. So, Mike, that is uh, what I would say what comic book creators can learn about writing and creating comics from The Breakfast Club. You are absolutely correct. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, I think there's a lot of visual storytelling in there. There's a lot of scenes without any dialogue. All the characters look the way they're supposed to look. And yet there is some visual evolution with them. Um, So much to unpack. Um, I'm really glad we did this. I hope people like this. Uh, Because if they like it, then we can do more of it. If they don't like it, then we'll never do it again. Or we can do more of it. Oh, Joe Kalinowski, who couldn't get the hanky to work on his leg, (laughs) said we we did a fantastic job, (laughs) fellas. So I'm going to take that because Joe Kalinowski is actually uh, way cooler than either of us, Mike. He's not hard to do. Look at that photo of him. He's just he's just cool. Wish I was that cool. He's just cool. Nice, nice guys. That was great. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So anyway, Mike, that was uh, a great show. It's almost exactly one hour. I am going to say good night to you and to everybody else. We'll roll the credits and we'll talk about what's coming next week. So Mike, thanks so much for joining up and preparing tonight to be part of the show. If you watch movies, I'll prepare. <laughs> All right. I'll keep that in mind. I'll see you next week, Mike. Bye. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Ari, and thank you for uh, watching with us. We did an extra long show. Um, oh, Glenn Gatella just said, right, Mike, we, we Glenn Gatella's down for this, but no more John Hughes films. I could agree with that. All right, all right. So we'll we'll try to we'll try we'll take requests. I hope this helped you as comic book creators, as writers. Uh, I hope you got to see the structure and the way you can bring characters together who are unrelated. Um, how to create an inciting incident how to understand how to put these characters into conflict, and then also how to build these characters, build a story in a visual way, thinking about the characters, the locations, the visual design, the colors, and all the other things that go into it. And I hope that this is useful to you as a creator in figuring out how you want to tell more effective stories. I hope um, I hope you join us again next week. Uh, we'll be here um, every Tuesday night. So thanks again, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Let me turn this off.